Welcome back to the Dusty Tone. In this episode, we return to Arthur Machen's classic, The Great God Pan, for Chapter 4, The Discovery in Paul Street. In the previous chapter, the story focused on Villiers, a well-to-do Londonite, and his chance meeting with an old college friend, Herbert, who is currently living in squalor and despair after he got involved with a mysterious, beautiful, but unsettling figure named Helen, who took him for everything he had and then left him. Villiers had a long conversation with his friend Austin, which only points out more weirdness and supernatural elements surrounding Herbert, and more specifically, his enigmatic spouse. If you missed any of that, I'm putting up a link to the Great God Pan playlist right now so you can catch it from the beginning. Now let's see where this mysterious thriller weaves its threads as our chatty friend Mr. Villiers heads over to the occult consumed Clark's house to share his newly found info with him. Enjoy part four, and we'll see you on the other side. Part 4 The Discovery in Paul Street A few months after Villiers' meeting with Herbert, Mr. Clark was sitting as usual by his after-dinner hearth, resolutely guarding his fancies from wandering in the direction of the Bureau. For more than a week he had succeeded in keeping away from the memoirs, and he cherished hopes of a complete self-reformation. But in spite of his endeavors, he could not hush the wonder and the strange curiosity that that last case he had written down had excited within him. He had put the case, or rather the outline of it, conjecturally to a scientific friend who shook his head and thought Clark getting queer, and on this particular evening Clark was making an effort to rationalize the story when a sudden knock at his door roused him from his meditations. Mr. Villiers to see you, sir. Dear me, Villiers, it's very kind of you to look me up. I have not seen you for many months, I should think nearly a year. Come in, come in. And how are you, Villiers? Want any advice about investments? No, thanks. I fancy everything I have in that way is pretty safe. No, Clark, I have really come to consult you about a rather curious matter that has been brought up under my notice of late. I'm afraid you will think it all rather absurd when I tell you my tale. I sometimes think so myself, and that's just why I made up my mind to come to you, as I know you're a practical man. Mr. Villiers was ignorant of the memoirs to prove the existence of the devil. Well, Villiers, I shall be happy to give you my advice to the best of my ability. What is the nature of the case? It's an extraordinary thing altogether. You know my ways. I always keep my eyes open on the streets. And in my time, I have chanced upon some queer customers. And queer cases, too. But this, I think, beats all. I was coming out of a restaurant one nasty winter's night about three months ago. I had had a capital dinner and a good bottle of Chianti, and I stood for a moment on the pavement, thinking about what a mystery there is about London streets and the companies that pass along them. A bottle of red wine encourages these fancies, Clark, and I dare say I should have thought a page of small type. But I was cut short by a beggar who had come behind me and was making the usual appeals. Of course I looked around, and this beggar turned out to be what was left of an old friend of mine, a man named Herbert. I asked him how he had come to such a wretched pass, and he told me. We walked up and down one of those long, dark Soho streets, and there I listened to his story. He said he had married a beautiful girl, some years younger than himself. And, as he put it, she had corrupted him, body and soul. He wouldn't go into details. He said he dared not, that what he had seen and heard haunted him by night and day. And when I looked in his face, I knew he was speaking the truth. There was something about the man that made me shiver. I don't know why, but it was there. I gave him a little money and sent him away. And I assure you that when he was gone, I gasped for breath. His presence seemed to chill one's blood. 
Isn't this all just a little fanciful, Villiers? I suppose the poor fellow had made an imprudent marriage, and in plain English, gone to the bad. Well, listen to this. Villiers told Clark the story he had heard from Austin. You see, he concluded, there can be but little doubt that this Mr. Blank, whoever he was, died of sheer terror. He saw something so awful, so terrible, that it cut short his life. And what he saw, he most certainly saw in that house, which, somehow or other, had got a bad name in the neighborhood. I had the curiosity to go look at the place for myself. It's a saddening kind of street. The houses are old enough to be mean and dreary, but not old enough to be quaint. As far as I can see, most of them are let-in lodgings, furnished and unfurnished, and almost every door has three bells to it. Here and there, the ground floors have been made into shops of the commonest kind. It's a dismal street in every way. I found number 20 was to let, and I went to the agents and got the key. Of course, I should have heard nothing of the Herberts in that quarter, but I asked the man, fair and square, how long they had left the house, and whether there had been other tenants in the meanwhile. He looked at me queerly for a minute, and told me the Herberts had left immediately after the unpleasantness, he called it, and since then, the house had been empty. Mr. Villiers paused for a moment. I have always been rather fond of going over empty houses. There's a sort of fascination about the desolate, empty rooms with nails sticking in the walls and the dust thick upon the windowsills. But I didn't enjoy going over number 20 Paul Street. I had hardly put my foot inside the passage before I noticed a queer, heavy feeling about the air of the house. Of course, all empty houses are stuffy and so forth, but this was something quite different. I can't describe it to you, but it seemed to stop the breath. I went into the front room, and the back room, and the kitchens downstairs. They were all dirty and dusty enough, as you would expect, but there was something strange about them all. I couldn't define it to you, I only know I felt queer. It was one of the rooms on the first floor, though, that was the worst. It was a largish room, and once on a time the paper must have been cheerful enough, but when I saw it, paint, paper, and everything were most doleful. But the room was full of horror. I felt my teeth grinding as I put my hand on the door, and when I went in, I thought I should have fallen fainting to the floor. However, I pulled myself together and stood against the end wall, wondering what on earth there could be about the room to make my limbs tremble and my heart beat as if I were at the hour of death. In one corner, there was a pile of newspapers littered about on the floor, and I began looking at them. They were papers of three or four years ago, some of them half-torn, some crumpled as if they had been used for packing. I turned the whole pile over, and amongst them I found a curious drawing. I will show it to you presently. But I couldn't stay in the room. I felt it was overpowering me. I was thankful to come out, safe and sound, into the open air. People stared at me as I walked along the street, and one man said I was drunk. I was staggering about from one side of the pavement to the other, and it was as much as I could do to take the key back to the agent and get home. I was in bed for a week, suffering from what my doctor called nervous shock and exhaustion. One of those days, I was reading the evening paper and happened to notice a paragraph headed, Starve to Death. It was the usual style of thing, a model lodging house in Marlebone, a door locked for several days, and a dead man in his chair when they broke in. The deceased, said the paragraph, was known as Charles Herbert, and is believed to have been once a prosperous country gentleman. His name was familiar to the public three years ago in connection with the mysterious death in Paul Street, Tottenham Court Road. The deceased being the tenant of the house number 20, in the area of which a gentleman of good position was found dead under circumstances not devoid of suspicion. A tragic ending, wasn't it? But, after all, if what he told me were true, which I am sure it was, the man's life was all a tragedy and a tragedy of a stranger sort that they put on the boards. And that's the story, is it? 
said Clark musingly. Yes, that is the story. Well, really, Villiers, I scarcely know what to say about it. There are no doubt circumstances in the case which seem peculiar. The finding of the dead man in the area of the Herbert's house, for instance, and the extraordinary opinion of the physician as to the cause of death. But, after all, it is conceivable that the facts may be explained in a straightforward manner. As to your own sensations when you went to see the house, I would suggest that they were due to a vivid imagination. You must have been brooding, in a semi-conscious way, over what you had heard. I don't exactly see what more can be said or done in the matter. You evidently think there is a mystery of some kind, but Herbert is dead. Where then do you propose to look? I propose to look for the woman, the woman whom he married. She is the mystery. The two men sat silently by the fireside, Clark secretly congratulating himself on having successfully kept up the character of advocate of the commonplace, and Villiers wrapped in his gloomy fancies. I think I will have a cigarette, he said at last, and put his hand in his pocket to feel for the cigarette case. Ah, he said, starting slightly. I forgot I had something to show you. You remember me saying that I had found a rather curious sketch amongst the pile of old newspapers at the house in Paul Street. Here it is. Villiers drew out a small, thin parcel from his pocket. It was covered with brown paper and secured with string, and the knots were troublesome. In spite of himself, Clark felt inquisitive. He bent forward on his chair as Villiers painfully undid the string and unfolded the outer covering. Inside was a second wrapping of tissue, and Villiers took it off and handed the small piece of paper to Clark without a word. There was a dead silence in the room for five minutes or more. The two men sat so still that they could hear the ticking of the tall, old-fashioned clock that stood outside in the hall and in the mind of one of them. The slow monotony of sound woke up a far, far memory. He was looking intently at the small, pen and ink sketch of a woman's head. It had evidently been drawn with great care and by a true artist, for the woman's soul looked out of the eyes and the lips were parted with a strange smile. Clark gazed still at the face. It brought to his memory one summer evening long ago. He saw again the long lovely valley, the river winding between the hills, the meadows and the cornfields, the dull red sun, and the cold white mist rising from the water. He heard a voice speaking to him across the waves of many years, and saying, Clark! Mary will see the god Pan! And then he was standing in the grim room beside the doctor, listening to the heavy ticking of the clock, waiting and watching, watching the figure lying on the green chair beneath the lamplight. Mary rose up, and he looked into her eyes, and his heart grew cold within him. Who is this woman? He said at last. His voice was dry and hoarse. That is the woman who Herbert married. Clark looked again at the sketch. It was not Mary after all. There certainly was Mary's face, but there was something else. Something he had not seen on Mary's features when the white-clad girl entered the laboratory with the doctor, nor at her terrible awakening, nor when she lay grinning on the bed. Whatever it was, the glance that came from those eyes, the smile on the full lips, or the expression of the whole face, Clark shuddered before it in his inmost soul and thought unconsciously of Dr. Phillips' words. The most vivid presentment of evil I have ever seen. He turned the paper over mechanically in his hand and glanced at the back. Good God, Clark, what is the matter? You are as white as death. Villiers had started wildly from his chair as Clark fell back with a groan and let the paper drop from his hands. I don't feel very well, Villiers. I am subject to these attacks. Pour me out a little wine. Thanks, that will do. I shall be better in a few minutes. Villiers picked up the fallen sketch and turned it over as Clark had done. You saw that? He said. That's how I identified it as being a portrait of Herbert's wife, or should I say his widow. How do you feel now? Better, thanks. It was only a passing faintness. 
I don't think I quite catch your meaning. What did you say enabled you to identify the picture? This word, Helen, written on the back. Didn't I tell you her name was Helen? Yes, Helen Vaughn. Clark groaned. There could be no shadow of doubt. Now, don't you agree with me? Said Villiers. That in the story I have told you tonight, and in the part this woman plays in it, there are some very strange points? Yes, Villiers. Clark muttered. It is a very strange story indeed. A strange story indeed. You must give me time to think it over. I may be able to help you, or I may not. Must you be going now? Well, good night, Villiers. Good night. Come and see me in the course of a week. seems confirmed that our dark doctor really did do a little more to poor Mary than just break her, huh? Oh, seems she jumped from the frying. Go, I'll spare you the poor wordplay. You know where this is going. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed part four of The Great God Pan. This puts us at the halfway point of the book, so please like and subscribe and throw some comments, good or bad, so we can keep doing what we do and we'll let you know when part five hits the interwebs. We look forward to seeing you the next time we crack open the Dusty Tome. <laughs>